Hello, I'm Dr. Randall Seacrest, your host for eOrthopod TV. Today I have as my guest Dr. Jim Mazzara. Dr. Mazzara did his medical school training at New York Medical College. He then went on to complete an orthopedic residency at St. Luke Roosevelt Hospital, which is a teaching hospital affiliate of Columbia University. Good morning, Dr. Mazzara. Good morning. Dr. Mazzara, what I'd like to discuss now is something orthopedic surgeons have been doing for years, and that is using arthroscopy to try and treat arthritis of the knee or degenerative arthritis of the knee. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's waxed and waned in terms of, of how we do this, but what I'd like to do is have a discussion about how we go about making that choice, what the risk and the benefits, and what, what patients can expect from that type of procedure to treat an arthritic knee. So first, let's define what we're talking about, the degenerative knee. What's going on there? Well, in arthritis of the knee, what we're really seeing is wear and tear of the surface of the joint to the surface cartilage of the joint, sometimes and very frequently combined with meniscus tears. The, there are two types of cartilage in the knee. The first type of cartilage is articular cartilage, which serves as a surface to the lower part of the femur or the thigh bone and the upper part of the tibia or the lower leg bone and the back of the patella. In addition to that, there's some other cartilage in the knee called the meniscus, and the, each knee has two menisci. Uh, one is on the inside, the other is on the outside of the knee. In many patients, they come in with a combination of arthritis, which is a wear and tear of the surface of the joint, and a meniscus tear. Those I find very challenging to treat because they have pain potentially from multiple sources. Patients come in and they say, my knee hurts, and as orthopedic surgeons, you know, it's our job to find out why their knees hurt. In many cases, if we localize the condition just to the knee, they may have a bit of arthritis or wear and tear, which we can see either on exam or x-ray. They may have a meniscus tear, which we may suspect on exam and confirm by means of an MRI. So those are the kinds of patients that I see in the office. And so in, in many cases, it's a range or a spectrum of wear and tear problems in the knee sometimes combined with other mechanical problems like that meniscus tear I mentioned. Mm -hmm. Now when that patient presents and, and you've, you've gone through an evaluation and you've done the MRI scan, the x-rays, and this person has what you would consider a relatively early onset of degenerative arthritis, meaning that it's not uh, that the knee is completely worn out and you're going to tell that person, well, the only option we have is an artificial knee replacement. We're in that middle ground where you're going to try to reduce some of the pain with uh, an arthroscopy. Um, how do you prepare that patient for surgery? What, what do you do to get to that point and, and how do you advise the patient? Well, if, if we're at the point where we're talking about arthroscopy, that really has to make certain assumptions that we have made sure that we've done everything else that's not surgical first. So the initial non-surgical treatment for somebody who may have just an arthritic knee would be activity modification, anti-inflammatories, sometimes cortisone shots, uh, sometimes what we call viscosupplementation or lubricant shots into the knee. The concept is to, uh, the, the concept that we relate to patients is very often we're going to smooth the inside surface of the knee with these lubricant shots. What it actually does is it, it restores some of the joint fluid to a more normal physiology, coats the nerve endings, and can relieve some of the pain by doing so, but at the same time can make a difference in patients who have milder, sometimes moderate degrees of arthritis. If we're getting to the point where we're talking about arthroscopy, we really want to help the patient understand that if they have an arthritic knee, we can go in and remove and debride some of those loose flaps and pieces of articular cartilage and sometimes make a difference. The real pain and the real benefit of doing arthroscopy in the arthritic knee is when the patient also has a meniscus tear. In those patients who have mild to moderate arthritis, if they also have a meniscus tear, those people will see all of the meniscus-related pain go away. But we, what we can't predict in those individuals is how much of that pain from the arthritis may go away. They may not have much relief, they may have a lot of relief, and everybody is very, very different but those patients need to be counseled preoperatively so that after surgery, if they come back and we found they have some arthritis, they're able to participate and cooperate with some of the post-op care that's required for treating that residual discomfort after surgery. If you have a pristine knee and a meniscus tear and there's no evidence of any arthritis, that patient may come back within a week and say, oh, my pain's gone and I can do most of my activities. On the other hand, 
if you have an arthritic knee and a meniscus tear, that patient may come back at a week or two and say, you know, I'm still having some pain and swelling. Instead of great recovery by two to three weeks, that same patient with the arthritic knee and the meniscus tear may take two to three months to get better, and sometimes you never get a perfect resolve. Mm. And so helping those folks understand that is an important part of what we as orthopedic surgeons need to do. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned making sure that you had tried everything up to arthroscopy. That yes. arthroscopy is not that first knee-jerk reaction, no. oh, this person has knee pain, let's put the scope in, no. look around, That's see right. what's going on, clean things up, and they'll be good as, good right. as new. H how have you found these other conservative mod modalities, such as the, the Synvisc or the, the uh, Hyalgen-type medications that you inject into the knee, anti-inflammatories, and you mentioned you mentioned activity restriction. How do these things all play together? And when you, when you use the term activity restriction, what are we talking about? Are we talking about keeping people from doing the things they like or, or what? Well, sometimes they just may have to do them a little differently. Mm -hmm. So somebody who wants to exercise and go to the gym may not be able to do running on the treadmill. They may have to choose a different kind of aerobic conditioning exercise that they find suitable. If they're doing weight training, for example, and they're doing leg extension exercises and they have patellofemoral osteoarthritis in the knee, how they do those exercises makes a difference. If you do full arc extension exercises and bend your knee to 90 degrees as you're lifting heavy weights, that may aggravate the arthritis in the knee significantly. But if you shorten the arc of your strengthening exercise and maybe flex your knee to 40 to 45 degrees, that can diminish it. So sometimes it's just a matter of finding out where the arthritis is and how can we modify their activity. Not that we want them to sit down and do nothing, that's not advisable, but at the same time, maybe changing their exercise approach may be beneficial for them. The, so the visco supplements that we inject can be very helpful in patients who have milder to moderate arthritis. And so I see patients in, in maybe the 60, I'm sorry, in the 70 to 80 percent range seeing some improvement in their knee pain with these visco supplement injections. Mm -hmm. Now what that means is that seven out of 10 people may get great improvement, but you still have three out of 10 people who've not seen any kind of improvement in their knee pain with these lubricant shots. And then we have to talk about other interventions. Now, can you dif differentiate a cortisone injection from one of these uh, um, visco supplementation injections? How do they differ? Cortisone is, a sing cortisone is a single injection that you give when somebody has an acute flare-up in an inflammatory component of their pain. And what that means is that when you look at their knee, they may have some fluid or swelling, and every part of the knee tends to be tender when you touch it. They may have some stiffness, aching when they sit for a long time. That stiffness, that startup pain tend to work, tends to work itself out as they go through their daily activities or heat up the knee a little bit. It tends to be short-lived, though. It doesn't really solve the problem long-term. So while it's very effective for certain circumstances, it may, not, it may or may not give people months and months of relief. And that's where the visco supplements come into play, where those are a series of injections, and depending on the version of the lubricant shot, you inject maybe three or five. Those people may get six months of relief and sometimes longer. The more advanced their arthritis, the less likely that is to work, however. So when somebody comes in and you take a properly positioned set of standing x-rays, those patients who have a significant deformity in the knee, who may also have bone touching on the bone and they have a complete absence of the cartilage in a certain part of the knee, those are people who will probably not get a lot of relief from either arthroscopy or from any kind of visco supplement injections. You may buy them a little bit of time with an anti-inflammatory or a cortisone shot. Eventually those people end up needing some other treatment and eventually get to the point where they need to have the knee replaced. Individuals with milder forms of arthritis, let's say they have a few millimeters of cartilage or just a slight amount of joint space narrowing on the standing x-rays, those are people who may actually do well with anti-inflammatories with physical therapy sometimes to stretch the stiff, painful parts of the knee, and if done properly, it can be very effective. But in many cases, uh, you have to be careful about how aggressively you do therapy, because just like exercise that can aggravate knee pain, so too can physical therapy aggravate your knee pain. So how it's done and who does it for you is very important. Uh, do, you, do you know 
or do you have any recommendations about the downsides of these type of injections? The cortisone injection and the visco supplementation, what are the downsides of those injections? Well, when you're dealing with cortisone, obviously you, you don't want to do excessive amounts of cortisone. It wouldn't be unreasonable to try a, a series of cortisone injections, maybe one, and then several three to four months later, consider another one, only if they've had a substantial degree of relief. If somebody comes back and they said, well, I got a week of relief after my first cortisone shot, that tells me it didn't work and more cortisone's not the answer. When it comes to the visco supplement injections, under the circumstances of getting relief, if somebody gets six months of relief, in many cases they can have it repeated. It depends on the version of the, the medication that you inject, but for the most part, if you get some kind of relief, it can be repeated up to a point where it's not effective anymore. So while cortisone and medication and these injections are helpful, we have to see some benefits from that. You just don't keep repeating cortisone or repeating the lubricant shots if it's not working for you. Mm -hmm. And when you think about the, the visco supplement injections to the knee, you do have to complete the course of treatment. You can't have one shot and say, well, I don't want to have the other two because the first one didn't work. Sometimes you have to have all three or depending on the brand, all five, and then give it a little time. In many cases, you'll see people getting some relief sometime after that. What is your opinion of the oral supplements like glucosamine, chondroit, and sulfate? Do, do, you, do you traditionally prescribe those, and do you think they're a benefit in osteoarthritis of the knee? Uh, I, I think there is. I don't think th there is a perfectly designed scientific study that says this absolutely positively makes a difference, but I think we have a lot of other studies that may be flawed to one degree or another that very strongly suggest that there are real benefits to taking things like glucosamine and chondroitin. I generally recommend for my patients that they do different things that have very, very low risk. Glucosamine and chondroitin is one of them. Weight loss is another. And sometimes, uh, depending on the pattern of arthritis, we we'll recommend a little heel wedge for patients to either uh, unload one part of the joint or another, d depending on where their arthritis is. Usually in patients who have arthritis on the inside half of their knee, we'll recommend what's called a lateral heel wedge. And what that does is that shifts some of the weight to the outside compartment of the knee where there's a little bit less arthritis. Doesn't help everybody, but if you do several different things and each of those things really help the patient just a little bit, all of a sudden they're feeling a lot better. And each one of those things may have an accumulative effect. When you're trying to help people determine how to modify their activities, is this something you do in the office or is this something that you rely on physical therapists to help a patient determine what activity is best for them with the least risk to their knee? I think it's a combination of both. Uh, I, I always have that discussion and I always want to ask the patient, what do you really want to do? Are you interested in going out and, and running 20 miles a day? If you are, your knee is going to hurt. If you want to modify that and stay fit and exercise, you mean to think about another type of exercise if you don't want to aggravate your knee arthritis. So while I do that, I also expect the therapist to do that as well. And it's an ongoing discussion. And you, it's part of taking a good history and just finding out what your patients expect of the treatment. But I think one of the things that um, it's, it's important for patients to understand is when you consider having an arthroscopy of the knee, and you have arthritis, the outcome can strongly depend on how much arthritis there is. So somebody who's got bone, touching the bone and advanced arthritis and deformity is not somebody for whom I'd recommend a knee arthroscopy. If they have a meniscus tear in the knee and milder or moderate degrees of arthritis, I might recommend that patient have an arthroscopy to clean up the knee and remove the loose flaps of cartilage, but they also need, need to understand they can't make their knee feel like it's 19 years old again. Okay, so there are limits to what we can do. When you're looking inside a patient's knee that has early onset of degenerative arthritis, what are you actually looking for and what, what are you trying to find to help that patient when you're doing the arthroscopy? We're trying to find loose flaps of cartilage that have peeled away from or delaminated from the bone attachment underneath. Arthritis is a process that initially starts with a little bit of softening of the cartilage. That softening and eventually leads to little tiny cracks and crevices in the joint. And those cracks and crevices eventually coalesce 
and all of a sudden the cartilage starts to peel away from the surface underneath. Cartilage is normally securely attached to the bone. As it becomes weak and arthritic, it peels away from the bone. The benefit arthroscopy, of arthroscopy is that we can go into the knee and remove some of those loose pieces and take some of that mechanical debris from inside of the knee and get it out of there. If the patient has a bit of cartilage left and they're willing to understand that therapy and extra treatment may be beneficial after, uh, may be beneficial after the surgery, they may be a good candidate for having an arthroscopy. But helping that patient understand that we can't make them perfect is, is very important. Now, over the years, there have been lots of different techniques that have been tried and designed to treat that, that the actual surface of the joint that is arthritic, arthritic during arthroscopy. Right. And they've, they've varied from essentially taking a burr and, and burring off that surface to try to get new cartilage to grow, uh, there have been drillings into that area, the microfracture technique, mm -hmm. and now even with smaller lesions, cartilage replacement and those sorts of things. W what is your approach to those procedures? Are we still seeing any benefit from those? Do you do any of those in your practice, or do you think that, that they've, they, they've gone by the wayside? No, I, I think they're very valuable for patients. I think the initial procedure you mentioned called the abrasion arthroplasty, not really done as much at this point, not very effective. And uh, so that's not a procedure that I, I think is of great value to patients. You're probably better off doing a simple arthroscopic debridement as opposed to burring it down to the bone. The microfracture procedure is very helpful in selected patients. So in somebody who ha has a uh, reason reasonable inside, of, the inside of the knee is not extremely arthritic, they might have a focal defect and they have good alignment to the knee and they're not somebody who is considerably overweight. Those are people who can actually benefit from a microfracture procedure. And the way that works is we go into the knee, and if the surrounding cartilage is actually in pretty good shape, but there's an area where it's damaged, we can remove some of the loose cartilage and sharpen the edges of the defect. And then we take a little microscopic awl or a pick, and we puncture the bone underneath. What that does is that allows little bone tunnels to be created into the joint. The cartilage itself has no circulation. The only way to get cartilage or blood into the knee, and blood is essential for healing, is to do this microfracture technique to open these channels through the bone into the subchondral bone, allowing the blood to come into the knee. And that fills this little defect that we've created surgically with blood. And that blood creates a patch. And that patch differentiates over a period of time into what's called fibrocartilage. And while it may not be as perfect as the stuff we're born with, it is probably the best way to resurface an isolated defect in the knee. And when we do that, we, when we look at the data from that procedure and compare it to the relocation of bone plugs, or what's called an Oates procedure from one part of the knee to the other, the microfracture procedure is actually very effective and comparable to any Oates procedure one might do. There are other procedures that can be often discussed with individual patients where we actually go in and harvest cells, reproduce some of those cartilage cells, the patient's own cells, and then re-implant it at a second procedure. And I do that procedure under selected circumstances for certain patients, but there are certain criteria they have to fulfill. They have to have an otherwise good cartilage in the knee and a good intact meniscus in the knee as well. So for somebody who may have more extensive damage, for somebody who may have a meniscectomy on that side of the knee, the reimplantation of the cartilage cells into the knee may not be effective. You may buy that individual some time with the microfracture procedure, but to relocate cartilage to that part of the knee may not be the best option. They also see patients who come in who are in need of a knee replacement. They have advanced knee arthritis. Those people very commonly want to know if I can grow their cartilage and reimplant it. And I unfortunately have to tell them they're about 30 years too late for that procedure and their arthritis is quite advanced. So those are individuals who are looking for something that's less invasive than a knee replacement, but still aren't appropriate candidates for the, the less invasive procedures. Mm. Yeah, I think it's a real misperception about the cartilage uh, regrowth and regeneration. Mm -hmm. That really, in my experience, is, is for patients who are re really relatively young patients yes. who have a, an ar articular injury yes. where they have a one focal area that for some reason that cartilage has been 
damaged and, and you've, you've got normal cartilage all around. So it's really fixing a hole like a pothole rather than taking a whole surface of a femoral condyle that is completely degenerative. Uh, you, you can't really get cartilage to grow on that. No, you, you can't. You're absolutely right. So it, again, it's, it's great technology, but that great technology has to be applied to the correct patient for it to be beneficial. So not every patient who comes in with knee pain can have the same procedure. And even though we can do a lot of surgery arthroscopically, the results and outcomes are somewhat different because each patient's condition is very different. And each patient starts with a different pre-op status and pre-op function and a different injury internally. And so you have to help those people understand that this is the condition of your knee. And so you might not get the same result that your neighbor did who's 20 years younger than you are, who doesn't have any osteoarthritis of the knee, who had a simple meniscus there. Mm. Your knee may be better, but not perfect, but there are ways we can help you with that. And uh, I, I really find that after 16 years of practice, I find that counseling patients on what you can do for them is very helpful, and helping them understand what you can't do is probably more helpful, uh, and helping those people through their post-op course is, is very beneficial to both of you because you establish a very good relationship with those individuals and they I think they understand that you're doing your best for them and you know their condition may just be worse than their neighbors. Mm -hmm. You know on the same note I think patients have this misperception about um, arthroscopy is this is something we come in we have as day surgery you go home and three days later you're back uh, you know running a marathon. Right. How do you try to counsel patients in terms of your recovery a lot of it depends on what we find in your knee and what the problem is in your knee and what we've done for it. For example, if you do a microfracture technique, that's a lot more surgery done through those two little puncture wounds or maybe three little puncture wounds, but there's a lot more to heal there. So how do you advise patients to expect their post-operative course to go? Well, it's going to depend on what we find. As you said, that's absolutely correct. And so somebody who has a pristine, beautiful knee, except for meniscus tear, might be able to get up and walk immediately after surgery, and that patient may come in within a week or two of surgery and, and have minimal to no pain, no swelling, get back to all of their activities based on how they feel. Somebody who's got arthritis in the knee may take two or three months to get better. That person, however, who has the microfracture might be on crutches for six weeks, sometimes eight weeks, depending on where the lesion is. They might need a lot of therapy and they may have a lot more swelling in the knee than either of those other two patients, either with the arthritis or the simple meniscus tear. So telling patients that you might find something that requires extra treatment in there is important. In many instances prior to surgery, when you look at the x-ray and you look at the MRI, you'll be able to give that patient a very good indication of what their post-op course is going to be. And a large part of our job is helping people with post-op expectations and results of surgery regarding those expectations. And so a lot of people will come through and say, okay, I understood what I was in for, and they can help with their own care, and I think that's important. People who don't have a lot of arthritis might not need a lot of physical therapy after surgery. Somebody who's got moderate arthritis in the knee who needs a cleanup and a meniscectomy might need arthritis for a month or two, uh, might need physical therapy for a month or two, and the patient who has the microfracture may actually need therapy for a couple of months and may need to do therapy for sometimes on their own at home for four to six months. Now I find those people who have the microfracture procedure do pretty well in the first six weeks. And the reason that is because they aren't really walking on it, they're not stressing it, they're not straining it. That second six weeks after the microfracture procedure tends to be a little bit more stressful for them. They have a little bit more pain, more swelling because they're now starting to bear weight and they may have pain and discomfort and swelling. The, from three months to six months, those people really seem to turn a corner and seem to do better. So somebody who's got a microfracture for an isolated cartilage defect in their knee could take as long as three to six months to see the benefit of that. Somebody who's got the meniscus tear in a week. But externally, you look at their knee, they just have two small punctures. Mm -hmm. So you don't really know what you've done inside until you talk to the surgeon or look at the pictures. 
because we can do a lot through tiny arthroscopic incisions these days. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing we should discuss too is that a lot of people have this notion that, well, I failed all of these things, the injections, the, the medications, the physical therapy, and now I have surgery and all of these things are not useful anymore. What, what is your feeling about the role, even of, of some of the visco supplementation, some of the medications after surgery? I'm assuming you still use some of those things after surgery uh, to control those symptoms. Absolutely, I think that's a very good point because once you've debrided the inside of the joint and you've taken all the mechanical debris and the loose flaps of cartilage out of there, you can still see some tremendous value to anti-inflammatories and therapy and a cortisone shot and, and lubricant shots to the knee. They can still be helpful now that the big loose flaps of cartilage are gone, this, it's still something to recommend to a patient. So. Just because they, have, they had it before and it may not have been effective doesn't mean it can't be discussed again and even recommended down the line. Yeah, but it's going to depend on what the inside of the knee looked like. Now, as we close on this, this discussion, which, which I think, you know, in, in the United States anyway, there is such a high prevalence as we age of knee problems that, that nearly 80% of the population is probably going to be faced with this decision at some point. You know, what to do with an arthritic knee. What advice would you have, both from a preventative standpoint, and then um, as we are trying to make these decisions for ourselves, uh, what to, to look at in terms of treatment? Any advice you would have along those lines for patients? Well, I, I think people need to recognize that we all go through a wear and tear process, and as we stay healthier for a longer period of time in our lives and we live much longer, uh, Mother Nature doesn't recognize these technology advances and our joints still wear out at the same rate they did thousands of years ago. The problem is that we're living longer and expect more. So we have to help our patients understand that there are things we can do to make them better and we can't always make their knees perfect. And having our patients have discussions with us about the options that are available is very, very important and creating realistic expectations for any kind of treatment is, is also an important part of our job. So when we talk about medicine or shots or therapy or surgery, we have to have our patients understand what the likely outcome of that is. But that's part of a discussion that we have with each individual patient. And quite honestly, each patient is very, very different in terms of what they expect and what condition they bring to the office. Well, thanks for an interesting discussion. I think uh, it's all good information. Thank, Thank you. you.